Uh, officially, we're talking about chapters 10 through 12. However, if we feel like it, we can go further um, and try to see if we can get to chapter 15. I've read all of those, so it doesn't matter to me. Um, I did not have time to reread 10 through 12 today, so I... Uh, I'm not as fresh as I normally am because I try to do like a reread on Sunday mornings where I go over stuff again. Mostly what Pema spends the beginning of chapter 10 doing is talking about, you know, the three, these three truths of impermanent suffering and egolessness, which, you know, uh, the usual, <laughs> the, the, the stuff we, we talk about a lot, if you're. You're doing the practice and stuff. Um, I really liked, though, where this interesting little mental image she gives us of this idea of buying a shirt. But then later years, you know, it's it's left your ownership. But then you see it as part of a patchwork quilt. I thought that was fascinating. Um, I think that has a lot of applications as an analogy when we think about the, the seeds we sow in others that we interact with. And the things we may affect them and put out in the world right yeah <laughs> but then i found it really interesting i highlighted inspiration and wretchedness are inseparable um and i think that pema goes into this quite a bit in her books in one way or another maybe touches it from different angles of this idea that you can't always untangle and neither should you untangle these what feel like opposing emotions right or sensations so yeah i think that that is a interesting part of what she does during chapter 10 and then that she really emphasizes that to really be practicing and recognizing impermanence it's kind of a 24 hour a day sort of practice which i think on the on paper you're like oh that sounds exhausting I don't want to do that. <laughs> At least for me. I don't know if anyone else feels that way. <laughs> mm. I'm At least I'm mindful most of the time these days, so... It's yeah. not a 24-hour practice, but you know, at least for the hours that I'm awake. <clears throat> and sometimes I... <laughs> I'm even awake when I'm dreaming, so... I wish I... Uh, being mindful meant I was automatically also acting better. I don't know about you guys, but I like... I can be perfectly aware of how I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> and you're like, oh, dang. <laughs> oh, you're like, oh, look how mindful I am. Mm, I did not want to be this painfully aware of the mistake I'm making right now. <laughs> well, it helps you learn your lesson better. I, I, I like to hope so. Yeah, eventually I'll learn my lessons. If you're not even aware you're making a mistake, you certainly won't learn from it. Um, I'd like to think this practice also makes me a better teacher, um, with my students because I do feel as though I'm more aware of how I'm speaking to them and talking. And even then though, it, like I said, doesn't stop me from making mistakes. Sometimes it's more like a, oh, that left my mouth. Oops. <laughs> uh, like I had some dispute with some students the other day. They were like doing a dumb thing, right? And uh, I was talking to this little girl when what I said to her was that that's okay. You're smarter than him. Fun fact. Oh, shouldn't have said that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and I knew it the moment it came out of my mouth. <laughs> but it's done now. <laughs> I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> if it can be fixed. But uh. Just, just shrug your shoulders and say, ain't I a stinker? <laughs> ain't I a stinker? I don't know. You know what? I don't think that little boy heard me. So hopefully she just gets some extra confidence from it. <laughs> <laughs> Free confidence. Free confidence. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, overall, I feel like it's, it's that same simple but still hard to implement message all throughout chapter 10. We get over to chapter 11 and then she gets into the four Maras. That's one of those fancy Buddhist words that I don't think about very often. <laughs> it's 
So it was interesting to spend some time with those words and those concepts. Um, I highlighted this sentence because I think it's interesting. This particular sense of obstacle occurs in relationships and in many other situations. We feel disappointed, harmed, confused, and attacked in a variety of ways. So it's these teachings and their um, different levels and disruption of our sense of harmony, right? And all of these things. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know that I left this chapter... When I had originally gone through this chapter, I don't know if I was in the right mind of focus. I really should have probably been more focused when I first went through the chapter. So I don't know that I've left it really understanding what she was explaining. Um, but she does list them out and go through them. Uh, the first one being <laughs> Deva Putra Mara, which is talking about the seeking of pleasure. Uh, second one has to do with how we recreate ourselves. She says the third one has to do with how we use our emotions to keep ourselves dumb or asleep. I thought that was a very like, ooh, what a dark turn we're taking, Pema. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Something about the way that sentence rolled out reminded me of emo middle school me. Um, wow. And then, the <laughs> and then the fourth one has to do with our fear of death, which, you know, always fun to look death in the face and be like, mm, someday I won't be here anymore. <laughs> Physically, at least. Um, then she explains these things, which is great. Once again, I don't know that I spent enough time here. If anyone else has a better sense of these, I would love to know. Because, like I said, my brain was not hyper-focused when I read these originally. I actually don't know what the Maras are other than uh, the demon of ignorance. Yeah. So I think for the first one, to completely pop the bubble of reality that we have come to regard as secure and certain to me, right? Like, so you seek pleasure to avoid pain. And so, uh, I think that pretty much sums that up if I have that right. And then with the second one, I, I found it interesting. So what she said the second one was on this page is different than how I felt like she starts it out over on this page, which she says is how we react when the rug is pulled from under us. Like, hmm, interesting. Um, and then she kind of leads into our habitual reactions to things. You know, we develop our habits, ha hab habit responses, um, sort of like automatic, non thinking responses, I think. And, uh, but then this whole concept of Trungpa Rinpo used to call this nostalgia for samsara, um, which I totally get, right? We, we crave the familiar. And so if that familiar is a particular flavor of suffering, we might crave it in a way, even though it harms us. I yeah, think you, you see, I think you see that a lot though, in like the cycle of abusive relationships. Um, and that's maybe an extra extreme step that is unnecessary. But I think about that sometimes when I see people stuck in these situations, you're like, just get out, just stop. And it's not always as easy as that. And sometimes there's a lot of psychological entanglement for them, right? They're just kind of staying where it's familiar because they're not sure how to function outside of it. And I think we're the same way with Samsara. Yep. Um, I'm always a fan of appreciating the comedy in our suffering. So she hits that. Um, talks about... Let's see, I don't remember which number Klesha Mara was, but it's uh, the strong emotions. A simple feeling will arise, and instead of simply letting it be there, we panic! We begin to weave our thoughts into a storyline, which gives us rise to bigger emotions. Ooh, that seems like cyclical thinking and intrusive thoughts to me. Um, so we keep our thoughts and emotions inflamed, and we won't let them go. Absolutely. It's also addictive, right? The emotional roller coaster of passion and big emotions, they're all very addictive to feel. Being kind of even all the time feels boring, I think, to a mind that craves that interest and sensation. I've had a. I, I have heard people complain that enlightenment is boring. <laughs> I won't say that I'm enlightened so much as I've entered an interesting hormonal stage in my brain. Maybe I've been on my medication long enough 
but I've had a weirdly flat experience. It's not that it's been not good because I don't mean to say I haven't been happy, but I've been at a weird place of just being. Um, and I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to feel or if it's of concern. But there is no supposed to. <laughs> but it's just I'm not feeling really big ups and I'm not feeling big downs either. But it's not in the same way I felt in the past when I was really depressed, right? It's not the same. Welcome. Welcome to equanimity. Yeah, I'm kind of in this weird equanimity of, of place, of equilibrium even. And so it's, I can see where it's boring, right? If this has any flavor of enlightenment to it, then I can see where someone would be mm -hmm. very bored. Because it's not, yeah. oh, everything's so cool. <laughs> it's just kind of like, yeah, this is how it is. I'm just, I'm just here. <laughs> it is what it is. It's just kind of the feeling, right? That's the one. So, I don't want to claim any kind of enlightenment. I think I'm just in an interesting phase of coming out of a depression and stuff, but also not being manic. It's just so, a phase, Mom. It's just a phase. Because I do laugh and stuff, but I don't feel the same... Um, I don't know. Like I said, it's just... There's no manic highs... Now that the low, the depressing lows are gone. It's because left and right touch each other. <laughs> I'm gonna say though, I'm grateful for it. If uh, if not having those low lows means I don't have the high highs, I'll take it. <laughs> do 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 do. So um. I always appreciate finding the teacher inside of the things that we think might be a problem. As she puts it, it is how what is seemingly ugly and problematic and unwanted actually becomes our teacher. And we learn to stop seeking security and perfection, you know. Hmm. And uh, when you get to that place, it can be its own kind of death. As it, with anything of letting go, I think. I think that can be applied to uh, many of the practice, right? The letting go, the um, releasing of your ego. is They're all forms of death. And to start to see death is just that reflection, I think, of impermanence as its own, um, you know, steps towards. <clears throat> Where did you get that, that letting go is, is equal to death? Because what I uh, got from this chapter is Oops. that... Um, Basically, when you're when you're clinging to stuff, that is more akin to death. Or when yeah, you're, um, when I you're... think I'm going just a. I'm probably remembering how I felt about it after I thought about it, rather than necessarily what she's saying. Because you're right. Um, if you cling too hard, you kill yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, because seeking can... security or perfection, which is clinging, <sighs> is some kind of death. I think that just for me, where I am at my in my practice, I've already gotten to a certain point of like, okay, yes, I get this. So now I, I guess in my own like back of my head, I've just started to be like, okay, well, everything is its own death. And so then I've applied that to this chapter <laughs> in my mind. Um, but that's just kind of a place where in thoughts I'm rolling around in my head. Um, but... Yeah, Ben, I think you're right. I, I went a little weird place with that, for sure. This is why other people besides me and Ben gotta read the chapters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I highlighted this because it was fun. To be fully alive, fully human, and completely awake is to be continually thrown out of the nest. Go, little birds, go. Beep, beep. <laughs> Fly, my pretties. Fly, my pretties. Fly. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. Ba oh, made basically you're jumping out of the nest yourself. So yeah, not staying in your comfort zone, but grabbing life by the balls and just <laughs> grabbing them by the balls, going through the full experience. Yeah. 
and of course accepting whatever arises. <coughs> Yeah. Chapter 12, Growing Up. Um, I absolutely agree with this statement that Pema puts here, which is listening to talks about the Dharma or the teachings of Buddha or practicing meditation is nothing other than studying ourselves. Um, one of my favorite things to bring up is how I find cognitive behavioral therapy to overlap heavily with Buddhism. And uh, I thought about that while reading this section. Um, studying yourself is this gateway to like understanding other people and stuff like that yeah appreciated that <laughs> however when we sit down to meditate and take an honest look at our minds there is a tendency for it to become a rather morbid and depressing project for real though <laughs> I've gotten so depressed before when spending a lot of time. Yeah, the like, misery tends to increase. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think Pema does a good job, though, of walking you through that thought process here and giving you opportunity to see how to kind of change the narrative on it and take the sort of depression that arises and seeing how it can be a useful tool. Um, I highlighted this. So there is an interesting transition that occurs naturally and spontaneously. We begin to find that to the degree that there is bravery in ourselves, the willingness to look, to point directly at our own hearts, and to the degree that there is kindness towards ourselves, there is confidence that we can actually forget ourselves and open to the world. And so I think that that's where been what I was saying, where she like kind of figures out how to turn that around. What I took from this again, um, and I, you may remember that I highlighted that in some of my prompts with regards to where we're at in our practice, that, uh, yeah, kindness or love or whatever you want to call us uh, when you are looking at all the, you, all the darkness within you, uh, mm -hmm. It's very important because otherwise it's it's it, it, there comes a point when it's when it becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, given some things you've shared in the sangha in the past, Ben, I think maybe tell me if I'm wrong. Do you empathize with this sentiment? She says on that next paragraph, often the only way we know how to react is to use it as ammunition against ourselves. Uh. I'm not sure that is something I see applying to myself. Um, I am, at least I feel I am at the point where I'm not judging myself too harshly, or at least not consciously. Good. But... Uh, yeah, just I mean to give to give an ex example of just today. So when uh, when my brother called me and said, "Oh, they wanted to come over," uh, <laughs> at first uh, that kind of triggered me because uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it was I it was called kind of surprised, and uh, you know it's Sunday, and I'm usually being on myself on Sunday, and uh, it was kind of uh, upsetting me in all kinds of ways and then when i investigated it i uh, thought because oh my my place place isn't perfectly clean up and i might be judged for that but really um, my brother and his wife they aren't the kind of people to do that so maybe i s thought i was just projecting and uh, projecting my own judgment until them so yeah yeah so in the end maybe i am still judging myself if unconsciously for some of the things i do yeah i um i think it's so i think that you said it's kind of hard to pinpoint sometimes what we might be doing now i think personally a much younger version of me was very prone to taking revelations of self and being like, well, that's why you're a piece of shit. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I, I did that as well at some point. <clears throat> oh, abso yeah, absolutely did that, yeah. There's no question about it. Um, if you guys don't feel like I've rushed too much, are you okay with me going over chapters 13 through 15 real quick? Or... Sure. Go ahead. But I won't be able to... To, to, to... Uh, correct you. <laughs> uh, I mean... You know... If y'all prefer, we can wait to do that until next meeting. No, I'm good. Go ahead. Do my, it. My baby sounds so sad in the other room. I wonder what my husband's doing. <laughs> um... So, uh, Winding the Circle of Compassion. Where I think you might be able to keep up, Ben, is because she spends these three chapters really hitting on topics from a couple other books we've talked about of hers. Mm -hmm. um, she gets into the Tonglin process and Maitri just a little bit. Uh, so, recently I was oh, talking yeah. with an old man who has been living on the streets, right? And so the feeling that he doesn't exist for other people. Right, He has this sense of loneliness and isolation that is intense. And he reminded Pema that the essence of compassion or s speech or compassionate action is to be there for people without pulling back in horror or fear or anger. And I think that um, where I was able to really start to empathize with this sentiment was, once again, as a teacher, right, where I have lots of kids who strike me on a variety of levels, some easy real easy to extend compassion to you're like ah oh, this kid's great <laughs> and then some who you struggle with you're like mm, you bit a kid last week i don't know if i can <laughs> you know how i feel about the, you right now mm. and i know it's not the same where she's talking about a homeless man and that's a very a much more visceral and like darker situation to be in but at the same time I think there is some overlap with the situation of where I find it harder to empathize with the student I just saw bite another student than it is the student who was bit. <laughs> I say because this happened on Monday. <laughs> it's more than once to people in the cheek in my dreams, so <laughs> I definitely, I definitely can empathize uh, with the biting. <laughs> Um, I come from a upbringing, so I, when I was a zealous member of the Christian church, the one thing I felt like my church did right, even now as I look back, is we spent a lot of time reaching out to the nearby community. We would make sack lunches for the homeless. Uh, we would go out to facilities that made box, bo like put together boxes of food for families in need, you know, things like that. that. We would spend a lot of time volunteering. And so as a church group, I felt like that's, when I look back, that's kind of like one of the things that was done right. And even then, with all of that positive action, as Pema puts it here, we find ourselves hating those people are scared of them or feeling like we just can't handle them. And I, it's kind of wild to me to realize that we can get into that mental position of, I've got to help them, but also don't let them too close to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I can um, also emphasize with that. So, like, this particular section has been a really interesting read for me because I have spent a sizable amount of time around a homeless population not just as a youth but even in a previous job and so even now um i had the opportunity to interact with the family we were able to give them something that they really needed and i had to conscious of myself and be very mindful of the uh, uprising emotions because there was a sense of like disgust because i was so mad at whatever circumstances i I at first was just mad at them because of what I the position I felt like they were putting their children in, but really I should I need to extend that further and be mad at the circumstances that put them in that position, right? The the parents not blame them for other anyway. That's a whole bunch of stuff I'm working through from this week. I had a very eventful week, guys. <laughs> mm, sounds like it. Um, as she puts it, we, we erect a barrier of blame, right? It's really easy to cloud our judgment of that and of everything and to blame others. Whether it's you blame the kids, you blame the parents, you blame the society, right? You just blame, 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 blame. <laughs> <laughs> a 
we, as she puts it, we scramble to find comfortable ground because once they're like, oh, yes, it's their fault. We're able to feel comfier about that. Um, here I highlighted, blame is a way in which we solidify ourselves. Not only do we point the finger when something is wrong, we also want to make things right. It's really interesting. She spins the next couple of paragraphs and then she says something along the lines of, we want to make things righter, even better, right? Like even you could have your relationship going perfect, but something back of your brain might be going, but how can we make it better? What's wrong with it? You want to poke at it. You want to needle at it, right? You could have a perfectly healthy relationship, whether it's with a sibling, a family member, your spouse, right? And you're, you just want to poke at it. Like, how can I, what's wrong with this? How could it be the best or how could it be more than it is? And I think it's interesting to me that impulse because I certainly have it. <laughs> um, ultimately, where she ends up is, you know, seeing people as they are and getting to this place of not trying to apply equality. I think Max points that out often when they make commentary during our talks um, of not ascribing... I'm trying to, I'm struggling for a word here. It's, it's it's quality definition vocabulary. You got it. Something along those lines. Um, where I started to really have kind of an emotional reaction to this chapter was where I highlighted how are we ever going to change anything? I think it's really like <laughs> I don't remember if this was this one or the next chapter and she really talks about how scary it is to open up compassion in your heart because I really do get to this really defeated like well how are we going to make it better <laughs> cuz I can I can drown in in the in the pain of what I and opening up to everybody's experiences you know what I mean Yeah and that's so overwhelming and we've talked about that before that drowning sensation i think and she's she's mentioned it in um one of the other books we've read the places that scare you i believe and it, oh that one's so hard for me especially as a teacher because i just i see kids coming from all sorts of circumstances ones i recognize in myself as where i came from and i just i hate that for them <laughs> i don't want to see my experiences in a kid because my experience sucked <laughs> so, you know what i mean Understandable, yeah. I don't want to look at a kid and know exactly where they're coming from because that means things are not good for them. And she calls this kinship of suffering, though, uh, as a form of finding our soft spot, the discovery of bodhicitta. Um, I would say this chapter is where I really started to understand what a bodhicitta is. I've known the word for a long time, but... This sort of opened up more of a meaning behind it for me. So I recommend chapter 14 a lot for that reason. Um, I think my brain got a little frazzled between where I highlighted here, though, and the next page. Because I see that I highlighted is said that in difficult times it is only Bodhicitta that heals. But I don't know what I thought I was going to say about it. <laughs> Oh, yes, this is where she starts talking about Tonglin. About that sending and receiving practice um, of sending out, taking in pain, but sending out pleasure to those who are suffering. Which is where I can start to get overwhelmed, weirdly enough. It's like I should be sending out peace, but all I've done is create a ball of anxiety inside myself. <laughs> But she really emphasizes that a wise, compassionate person is just uh, is there for others. And I like that. See, we think that by protecting ourselves from suffering, we are being kind to ourselves. The truth is we only become more fearful, more hardened, and more alienated. We experience ourselves as being separate from the world. And I think that that's probably the key of a lot of issues. <laughs> Right, you avoid there it is. Yeah, that reminds me of the the security paradox, where mm. mm -hmm. the more 
people are secure, the more they are worried, and then they then they move to these gated communities. But really, oh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they are more, yeah, they they are they are really afraid all the time, and even though they are they are or really safe, but yeah, they are. They They're like, I need to be more to... safe. Mm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've seen that in action in family members. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Max, were you going to say something? No. <laughs> So I um, made a comment in the Sangha chat because this is where this chapter like brought up some weird emotions and memories for me. And so as they're talking about uh, a man who had, I believe it's the man who had AIDS um, and how he would pr utilize the Tonglen practice and stuff. And so he says, it doesn't hurt me. It makes me feel that my pain is not in vain and that I am not alone and useless. It makes all of this worthwhile. And <laughs> I became I became like aware of an old memory of when I was real little and some bad stuff was happening. And I had almost the exact same thought <laughs> of how and that thought was what got me through like some really really bad shit. <laughs> Was how I was going to use this pain to help other people. And I look back and I'm like, how in the world did I form that thought? Because I'm not that person anymore. But I'm really grateful that somehow that became the forefront thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it ended up being a very shaping and foundational thought for how I moved through life. And how I'm able to see obstacles sometimes instead of something that's overwhelming. It's, well, how is this going to be a tool for me later? And I wish I knew how it originated. <laughs> but it was there. And I just thought about that younger me. And I had a lot of uh, compassion and empathy for them, you know? And Yeah, sounds like you... Used to be a noble person. <laughs> <laughs> used to be, yeah. I suck now, but don't worry. Used to back used to be prime. someone pretty. <laughs> back in my prime of nine years old. Uh... <laughs> um. So she talks about a little bit about these opportunities for your awakened heart to be discovered, and dives more into you. Because bodhicitta awakens tenderness, we can't use it to distance ourselves. Bodhicitta can't be reduced to an abstraction about the emptiness of pain. We can't get away with saying, there's nothing happening and nothing to do. <laughs> it sounds like bodhicitta is really action-oriented. And maybe I'm not fully understanding it, but that's how it seems to me. But then it's also... In all of these little moments, too. It's not just, like, in really big action moments of, like, all right, we've just lost ten good men, and now I shall practice bodhicitta on the battlefield. <laughs> it's in the moments. I don't know. I'm bad at wording stuff today, but I really did think this chapter was very good. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, chapter 15 has a lot more awakening of p compassion. And the different types of people that we learn to care for and how we continue to use the Tonglu practice. Tongue practice is a method for connecting with suffering, our own and that which is all around us, everywhere we go. It is a method for overcoming our fear of suffering and for dissolving the tightness of our hearts. Primarily, it is a method for awakening the compassion that is inherent in all of us, no matter how cruel and cold we might seem to be. This is the core of the practice, breathing in others' pain so that, 
so they can be well and have more space to relax and open. Breathing out, sending them relaxation and whatever we feel would bring them relief and happiness. And I'm like, aw, this feels like the definition of a good friend. <laughs> Too, like, not just compassion to a whole world, right? But this practice that we could even just bring to our more intimate relationships, right? Of Like, how can I breathe in for you and help you relax? Yeah. Um, where the title of the chapter comes in of about going against the grain, it really comes, uh, gets summarized here where I highlighted truthfully, this practice does go against the grain of wanting things on our own terms, wanting everything to work out for ourselves, no matter what happens to the others. The practice dissolves the walls we've built around our hearts. It dissolves the layers of self-protection we've tried to so hard to create. In Buddhist language, one would say that it dissolves the fixation and clinging of ego. So chapter 15 really gets into the nitty gritty of the Tonglen practice, I think. And then she gives us a nice play by play of what that might look like when putting it into practice. And then I highlighted this because I thought it was fascinating. Use what seems like poison as medicine. Um, I think it ties back to what really struck me in chapter 14 about that. Well, how can this be a tool later? How can this be medicine later, even though it feels like poison now? To become familiar with suffering is to become able to overcome and understand <laughs> suffering. Yeah. So, yeah. Tonglen can extend in infinitely, in case you didn't know. Infinite power? <laughs> That's how you reach immortality. Godspeed, everybody. Bye-bye. No. We did it. We did it. So that was chapters 10 through 15. No, wait. Yes, 10 through 15. Math is hard. <laughs> Any thoughts? Anybody wants to share about everything we just went over? I know we sped, sped run it. Speed run it. No. No. I really like uh, Emma. She talks about that difficult shit, you know? <laughs> I agree. 